So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for October 5th, 2023. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct the meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an action item, agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Lichter? Present. Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Present. Ms. Damanowski? Here. Ms. Stolowski? Present, sorry. <laughs> She's here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, my turn. Ms. Cox, please call this role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. DiDonato. Present. Ms. Shea. Present. Dr. Elmendorf. Present. Dr. Wistead. Present. Ms. Myers. Present. And we also have Mr. Kearns with us. Pre present. Okay, so I think you just called the roll call staff members participated. We did that one. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, all right, so we have everybody counted for, correct, Ms. Cox? Yes. Okay. Um, committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair, then saying their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying the name first, then speaking. Staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. If the chair calls for any motions, the committee members will move and say their name, and a second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state, may I have a roll call vote, please. Um, assistants will speak each um, committee member for their vote and record appropriately for the ETA. So hello everybody and thanks. Feels like it was just last week when we um, <laughs> when we met. Um, but again, thank you everybody for coming back again this week and thank you um, Dr. DiDonato for working on the agenda. So first is um, I think hopefully a pretty easy one, the materials of instruction discount program. So I think we have Ms. Shea and Dr. Wisted. Um, so Dr. DiDonato, is there anything you want to say first? No, I let them take this one away. It is a pretty straightforward one, so we can keep ourselves moving. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Mr. Kurtz. Can you go to the next slide? Good afternoon, um, board members. Um, Chair Lichter and the whole curriculum committee. Uh, we actually bring this one every couple months. So this is a large uh, contract that really allows us to provide a wide range of materials at a discount price. Um, these are materials not related to core instruction, but range from everything from sentence strips to art supplies and everything in between. Um, we have seen uh, an increase in the spend against this contract, uh, specifically when we open a new school. A lot of that new startup funds comes from this contract and is applied like we did with Rossville last year. And then certainly Dr. Wistead is here to join me because many of these materials, um, we've seen an increase based on uh, the community schools initiatives and some of the Constitution of Poverty grant funds. Uh, you can go to the next slide, um, Mr. Corns. So this um, contract includes includes uh, many different vendors and over 5,000 different items, most of which, as I said, are supplemental instructional materials. They are not core curricular materials. Um, it is used by schools um, primarily and by central offices. Um, and I will invite Dr. Wisted if she wants to add anything specifically around community schools. Um, no, just that, you know, as you're all aware, the community schools get additional funding um, after they're in their second year. Um, and so as a result of that, they at times leverage items like this, especially when it's community related activities that they um, may be doing or they often spend their community schools funds on um, an extended day type program and then they may be buying materials. Uh, for students to participate in activities that would spend on this contract. 
OK. Um, board members, anybody have a question about this contract? Chair, look, I have two questions. Go ahead, Ms. Booker Dwyer. So my question, so whenever it comes to supplies, I'm always thinking about number one, the student supply list that goes home all the time that uh, you know parents are asked to purchase uh, all of these supplies that feels like never get fully used. And then, um, you know, VCPS, they have warehouses full of stuff. And so can you speak a little bit to how do you go about like inventorying what's in the warehouse and first starting with those resources and then looking and kind of doing that audit of what you've asked families to purchase before leveraging um, contractual dollars for any of these supplies. Dr. G, you know, you want me to start that or did you want to go first? Oh, well, I was going to just share oh, go ahead. about. Oh, yeah, go uh, ahead. Look, I'm writing a note down about her question. I'd like totally yeah. not paying attention. Sorry, go ahead, Dr. Rosten. Yeah, I can speak to um, the requirement of schools to contact the warehouse before they buy materials. We do request that of them for larger items like furniture and things like that. Um, but what happens with the Title I and community schools dollars, um, you know, it, it's a very specific process that's followed that it, you know, aligns to their needs assessment, their specialist approves it, their accountant approves it, right? So it goes through like a lot of critique before it is spent, but I'm not aware of a process where we request schools to contact a warehouse for these types of items, because mostly my understanding is what's in the warehouse is larger furniture type items or potentially, um, you know, textbooks or, or things like that, that might be at the warehouse. So that was my input. I don't know if others want to comment on that. Yeah, so I was going to add two pieces. I'll start with where you left off just for continuity. Um, our warehouse is really less of a warehouse and more of a logistics center. So it's really designed to not be long term permanent storage of everything. And so to that end, it is mostly used for big purchases of curricular materials and getting them out to schools, but then maintaining some overage so that we can be quicker to get to schools with things like bridges, consumables, and open courts so that when you enroll one student, you don't have to wait for us to do a purchase order. So we do store. There is some warehouse aspect of it, um, but it's much more of a logistics where, so these types of, we, we don't store high volume of pencils, markers, chart papers, those type of things. We do have a supply of um, curricular materials and I will offer and certainly Dr. Graham can speak to this uh, more. I frequently get emails from the warehouse that they don't want to keep things in there, that they want me to get things to school because they're looking to have that space for the purposes of logistics to get things to school. So we don't have a tremendous supply of things that are covered by this, those supplemental materials that would be enough for like an entire school. Sometimes we have smaller, but when we do, they're really good. The, the team in the warehouse is phenomenal and they're really good about reaching out to me and saying, are you sure these you know, math books can't be you know, somewhere else because they're trying to partner with that. What I will say is we also see are seeing an increase in our partnership with the Ed Foundation. So Debbie Phelps speaks a lot about um, how she can be a part. So she does help with things like binders and class sets of stickers and some of those smaller items. Um, but again, not always at the volume. This is more used like when a school is having a family math night and they need to buy things of a sufficient quantity to support all their families or when they're looking to purchase, you know, art supplies for the year to keep up with, you know, some of those pieces. Um, and so while we do, um, and, and Debbie Phelps and the Ed Foundation are tremendous partners, um, that's where this piece comes in. But I do want to offer because we did take your feedback back around school supply lists and we did talk to the executive directors of schools and they did work with principals this summer to really lean in and say re-examine those uh, school supply lists and leverage some of these avenues whether it's the Ed Foundation materials that we already have um, and materials that they're allowed to purchase through some of these other grant opportunities and really whittle down those school supply lists so that it's only those things that they need. So that is Definitely, um, you know, we spoke to them this summer. Some of those things had gone out in report cards this spring before, so I think that'll continue to improve. Uh, but I just did want to circle back because we did take that to heart, and, and the EDs of school did follow up with the the principals on that. 
Thank you. That's so good to hear. So thanks for yeah. that clarification. Sure. Did you have another question, um, Ms. Booker Dwyer, or was that the two? No, that answered. Okay. Nope. Yeah. okay. Any other board members have a question? Okay. Then may I, I have a motion to approve contract ARA 203-22, the materials, the instruction discount program materials. So move Stileski. Thank you. May I have a second? Second, Booker Dwyer. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Cox? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Dolowski? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Next item is um, the Elementary English Language Arts Curriculum HMH Spending Authority. So, um, you receive some information about this through the um, pre work, but we have um, Dr. Kraft and Ms. Shea available to answer any questions. But, Ms. Um, Ms. Dr. DiDonato, would you like to start this one? Yes, I would. Mr. Forns, can you go to the next slide? So, before we go into actually what the request is, I wanted to talk a little bit about understanding contract spending authority because I think sometimes when we come to the board and, you know, as a spectator at board meetings, as a parent, I'd hear, oh my gosh, th this one office is spending all of this money. But the way co contract spending authority works is a little bit different. And so I wanted to sort of put that out there. And Ms. Shea alluded to it as she was talking about um, in the previous contract. So when we look at contract spending authority, I, I have a diagram here, but I want to try to give you a different type of context of it. So think about your family cell phone plan. So I'll, I'll speak to my family. So our family cell phone plan and instead of a year of a contract, I'm going to go with a month, right? So in the month of our family cell phone plan contract, I have 500 minutes that we can make phone calls and 500 text messages that we can spend. So during the you know month of August, I made 100 minutes of calls. My daughter made 100 minutes of calls and my son made 200 minutes of calls. So we were at 400. We're still below the 500 minutes of phone calls for the month. Same thing with text messages, great. Okay, the month of September happened back to school. Kids aren't calling as much. They're now texting each other. So I spent 200 minutes on phone calls. My son spent 50, my daughter spent 50. Again, we are under our 500 minutes, great. Now, text messages. I sent 250 text messages. My daughter sent 250 text messages. My son went to send one and it was, he couldn't send it because we were at that 500 text message threshold. So it, it, we can't go over it. And so spending authority is very similar to that. So we've got this big amount up here, but everything we purchase, whether it's the curriculum office purchase it, purchase it, purchases it, whether it's a schoolhouse purchases it, or it's a repurchase of something that we do every year, like buying new materials, consumable books for students. And so all of that wraps up into this big number at the top. And so what happens is, and Ms. Shea and Dr. Wissett both were talking a little bit about some of our community schools have additional funds and the purpose is for them to be able to do things with their communities and with their families. One of the things that we like for them to do is they're doing things that actually involve the curriculum that we're working on with kids at schools. So when they want to purchase things like vocabulary cards to support students, which wasn't in our original order, they want to supplement with this and maybe they have more English language learners than they uh, originally thought they were going to have and they really want those visual supports for them. So they purchase more of those. They're using their money but it comes all under this one umbrella. And so it then takes away our office's ability to then order those supplemental replacement materials the next school year. So all of those things go under there. And so sometimes when we're asking for spending authority, it doesn't mean we're gonna spend all of that. And it doesn't mean the curriculum office is gonna spend all of it, but it's coming from lots of different places. And so the graphic here really tries to illustrate all those things that really come into spending authority, because I, I understand we need to be fiscally responsible. And believe me, you can ask anyone on the call, so we're looking at budgets, we are being very fiscally responsible. 
But sometimes we get in these situations where schools do have money and we want them to spend it on things like this and not things that might not be as aligned with things that we're doing in school. So you can see we have the initial um, centrally purchased materials. I gave you just a little snapshot of things. Some example of supplemental materials that might be purchased by a school. And again, these are just some ideas. And then additional centrally purchased materials. And so those might be materials that are purchased on a yearly basis, like consumable books, or it might be additional teacher's guides or student materials based on, and we say a lot of times like based on change in enrollment, but change in enrollment doesn't necessarily mean that the enrollment as a whole is getting in, bigger in a district. It can mean that things like get disproportionate by a grade level. So suddenly one school has, and it usually happens like this, a whole lot of third graders enroll. Well, we ordered third grade materials based on last year's numbers and the prediction of third graders. They might have extra second grade books. They have a ton of extra fourth grade books, but they don't have extra third grade books. And so we'll look countywide at what the enrollments are, but we might not be able to balance it just by getting the extras from another school. And this allows us to be able to do that. Um, so I wanted to give you just that that overview of, of spending authority to really help with that understanding, because I think that's a challenge sometimes and just even myself understanding it. Um, so hopefully that analogy was a good visual, a, a good auditory in the graphic um, helps some, but I will now turn it over to uh, Ms. Shea to sort of walk you through those other little pieces and give a little more detail about it. Thank you, Dr. DiGiotto, and I apologize. Um, poor Dr. Graft is not feeling well, so I'm going to um, channel her expertise here. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Dr. DiGiotto did a great job of understanding how the limits and spend authority really put us in a place where even when we're trying to do meaningful purchases, it, that becomes difficult. But I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what are some of the new asks that have come up since we first came and said this is how much we anticipate needing? Um, because I think that that's fair too, is to expect us to do a really good job of calculating that anticipated spending authority. So I wanted to talk through a few specific examples. So the first I want to talk about are the vocabulary cards. The And I hope you guys are visiting classrooms. If you haven't yet, hopefully you will soon um, because you will see these. The vocabulary cards were a part of the initial purchase for K through two because that's the only grades they existed for when we did the purchase. HMH heard such powerful feedback from teachers all over the country for the intermediate grades that they actually produced them in August. So they didn't exist. So when we calculated our spending authority and came for the contract, it wasn't an option to buy them. They were available digitally, but not in print. HMH responded to feedback from teachers all over the country that said they were such a valuable resource specifically for multilingual learners and students with language-based learning differences. And then our teachers said, where are our vocabulary cards? And, and how can we use them? And so then even when we found ourselves in a position to potentially use grant funds, for example, to support multilingual learners, we can't purchase this um, newly developed resource. So that's one very specific, timely example. Another example is that in some of our elementary grades, um, schools use an approach called departmentalization when they are planning. And what that means just for level setting is that you might have, if you have uh, four teachers in third grade, you have two teachers that teach ELA and science and two teachers that teach math and social studies and the children rotate halfway through the day. In some of our elementary schools over the summer, in being responsive to the needs of their students in this upcoming year, they de-departmentalized. And what that means is they decided that every teacher would be a teacher of literacy and kids would all be in their own classroom, which then made the request that we had ordered for two ELA teachers at a school, and now they're going to have five teachers of ELA at that school. Um, and so that's something that is um, timely and relevant that schools are making decisions about. Um, and again, each grade level has different needs. And so when school principals are working with their staffing to figure out the best way to support their students, that is something that might shift, which then has an impact on spending authority. Um, two other examples that I just wanted to share is um, the uh, writer's notebooks. So we did pilot writer's notebooks in our pilot schools and we had mixed reviews. Some teachers liked them, some teachers didn't. And uh, Ms. Booker Dwyer, as you also talk about school supplies not always getting used, we didn't want to purchase a writer's notebook and have it be empty, right? It might not be 
Um, and actually, that's the kind of tool that should be school by school in the sense that some schools have journals that they already keep, and so they don't need a separate writer's notebook specific for HMH. But we heard from many teachers and principals whose teachers really love the writer's notebooks because they can see them digitally, right? They can see because they have access to everything. And so that instead of printing and copying them, they're saying, why can't we use some of our supplemental funds to differentiate? Um, and then the other piece, and, and I'm going to invite Ms. Myers to join too, we work very closely together in how we make sure we're providing equitable access for our students um, receiving services for special education, in some cases outside the general education setting. And part of that work through all the incredible work she and her team have done with the strategic plan has created opportunities for us to work between ELA and special ed even more closely. And so part of that work this summer involved in ensuring that students in these programs had access to grade level content, especially in our primary grade classes, so that we know that before that decision is made, that a student isn't on track for um, the diploma, that we make sure that they have access to grade level content. And so Ms. Myers can talk a little bit more about how we shifted what we wanted to provide in those classrooms related to HMH. So Ms. Myers, do you want to join, uh, chime in there? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you, we've all, you know, heard I think in different portions around kind of the work around where those ideas and um, strategies have been around kind of increasing achievement for special education. And one of those is really looking at how we are having that seamless integration of general education and special education um, for our students. And we realize that in our what um, Ms. Shea is referencing are our integrated service delivery model classrooms, which are previously known as maybe our functional learning or communication learning support. We were predominantly using what was unique learning system, which is a um, curriculum that was um, highly modified to be able to support the needs of our students. Um, yes, aligned with alternative standards, but we have some students in there, as Ms. Shea referenced, that that decision hasn't been made yet. So they may be in a space where they really are um, needing highly modified content, but they're still working towards a diploma. So really ensuring that they have access to the appropriate materials during that. Also, the, the grade fluctuation in those classrooms is an additional. So there might be, you know, a couple kindergartners, maybe a first grader, maybe a couple third grader. It just does. So we wanted to ensure over time how we provided support was that those teachers in those classrooms would access the, the curriculum materials from the school building. And what we're shifting to is ensuring that um, those teachers have their own materials, their own access for students so that there isn't a need to have to, you know, borrow that there. We're ensuring that our students in those classrooms have the, have equal access. So um, I think that that really then led to again just kind of an increased need for um, for for materials associated with HMH, and we're excited. We also are having our public separate day schools access HMH, um, which is also really important. So um, White Oak always has, but Battle Monument and Maiden Choice and Ridge Ruxton ensuring that also while modified, our our kiddos have their grade level you know books. We want a fifth grader be able to see the same book that their you know fifth grade in a um, comprehensive school will be able to see. And yes, the delivery is highly modified and the content's modified, but we want them to be able to have those tangible things that are um, grade level content. So just um, we're actually really excited about this. So thanks. And so I just wanted to share some very specific context of like you were just here. Why didn't you anticipate? Which is a fair question, um, but just to share some very specific things from an instructional lens that have come up in our partnership with schools and in our partnership with special education um, of why we believe this increase over time will allow the flexibility for schools and for different offices like special education or ESOL to use um, different funding sources, but in a way that's aligned to that core curriculum and that evidence base that we're trying to strengthen. So um, I welcome any questions that you have for me, um, but that is essentially the, the content background. I know you already had the slideshow to know the difference, but I just thought it would be helpful to give some very specific examples of um, things people are asking for and why we've told them they have to hang on. <laughs> <laughs> You're muted, Jamie. Oh, Chair Lichter, sorry. <laughs> Questions from board members. Um, who? No questions? This one this comment. Book. Go ahead. This presentation wasn't, it's not posted on um, board docs. 
any of it or just I know that Dr. DiDonato adjusted. I added the, slide, the one slide. But, but none of it's no posted. presentation is on there. Nope, I can't see any. Did unless someone I thought else. I did. You can't we see can. any of the presentations, um, Ms. Booker Dwyer? Nope. All of them except for this one. Oh, 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 oh. We can certainly follow we up can, on that yeah. because it was submitted at the same time, but thank you for that. We'll make sure that it's up. I don't know why, but thank you for that. Yeah, we'll it was the that. same for me. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Surprise. Right. Well, we'll update that. <laughs> um, do you have any other questions, Ms. Booker Dwyer, about the content? No? Okay. Um, Ms. Zaleski, you said you had one, a question? Um, yes, thank you. This was actually a really logical explanation of <laughs> this contract spending. I just had two questions. First, um, you know, to help, and I loved your analogy with sort of that cell phone plan. Are there any grants that we can take advantage of to reduce the cost of the overall spending? And then two, are there any supplemental materials um, that we can purchase for families to have to use to support the reading at home? Thank you. So to your first question, as far as using grant money, a lot of times schools and we do use grant money, but that still gets taken a into this top spending authority. So even if we got a grant for $3 million to purchase every supplemental thing that a school wanted to do, we would still have to have $3 million of space between what we've spent in that top number. Otherwise, we couldn't use the grant funding or the full amount for that. So it's really everything that gets purchased related to this gets added to this number up here. And so that's sort of like the the decreasing value of what you have left to spend. OK, thank you. But, um, the second piece about supplementing. So some of our schools, um, one of the other resources that HMH has that uh, some teachers in some communities really love is the Read and Respond Journal. Um, again, I always think about now Miss Booker Dwyer. Could it be just a composition notebook? Maybe, but it's part of what's in uh, the digital. But some schools really, they saw them online and they want them because of that homeschool connection. So this is something that would go back and forth that would really capture, this is what I'm working on in my classroom, which when we think about supporting families, some of our schools are really interested in, in purchasing that resource specifically for that. Um, and then the other piece is, as illustrated by the vocabulary cards expanding to the intermediate grades, even though they're a huge, conglomerate, HMH is really responsive and they've been talking to us about what are families seeking in terms of other resources. And so while they don't have, they have a lot of parent resources online, they have not yet identified materials, but by increasing the spending authority, should that come up, that would give us an avenue to do that. But it would allow schools to purchase materials for some of those family reading nights. Um, and sometimes that comes along with, you know, some of the supplemental texts, or like I said, some schools have wanted these read and respond journals. And it's interesting, you know, part of what we piloted was, should we purchase this or not? How useful is it and how does it work? But of course, our schools are not a monolith. And so the students that they serve are different. The needs of the teachers are different. And so this would allow that flexibility um, for when that's something that your community really engages in as a principal, you would work with your team to identify and then potentially seek grant funds or, you know, operating funds um, to do that purchase. But they would all, as Dr. D. Donato said, fall under the same spending authority ceiling. And that's Thank what's you. tricky for schools because, you know, and, and and I think the cell phone minutes are great because some of the people on my plan live in 176 other buildings. So they're using my minutes and I don't even know, right? So like part of that analogy that's really helpful is that we all go to the same spending authority, you know, so the schools will say, but I have this money and I want to purchase it this way, but they all kind of come together. And that's a tricky part of our work because while we shepherd it, we really do want to encourage schools to be thinking about their own school communities and doing that. So we have to allow for that um, possibility. Yes, and that's a great point. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions from board members about the 
So just just a quick comment. I also did not have the presentation, which so I think it might be a universal type right. of thing. Um, like but I it, based upon Ms. Slusky's um, question, I do think it's important for the public to see that as well, because I think that was a, a wonderful explanation that oftentimes the public is not understanding that um, spending authority ceiling. So I would love to have that updated on board docs, even though you know we've already gone through the presentation. I think it would be great for the public to have access to that. Absolutely, we will follow up on that. Was um, was there a narration with the slideshow? There was. Okay. No. Well, because there I was think, with the okay. with the not for this right. first little story slide. Okay, because I think that this is such um, a misunderstood term, spending authority, um, and it, most people think you central office is asking to spend more. So they don't realize that these are individual schools and they could be using their Title I funds to Ms. Stileska's, um, they could be using grant funds, but mm -hmm. as soon as we hit that limit, you can't use any funds no matter where they're coming from. So I think your explanation, the cell phone was a really good way of um, explaining it because it comes up a lot with other contracts for other pieces when that spending authority versus what we're actually spending. So maybe to narrate even using your um, analogy phone. with the cell phone so that to Miss um, Pumphrey's point, if the community listens to it, it makes an instant connection. For most people, I think it'll make an instant connection to what you're what we're trying to convey. So since we have to repost it. Um, yep. We add that, that piece. OK, um, but thank you. And especially with HMH, because it, the, the misconception is going to be we just approved right. this we're expanding last, it and we're right. Yeah, right so why are we already asking for more but you're right because everything is online teachers are seeing every little piece of resource that comes with the um with the curriculum that you may not have decided to purchase but they may have funds that they want to do it so um this is um was a really good explanation so thank you for that any other questions i i i, I got a question and okay. a comment Go ahead. Um, so again, I agree. This is a, a great um, way to explain spending authority. Um, the only thing I, I would want to try to add to it, if we could, or this was probably more for contracts, is just because we don't know who's spending what and who wants what. It's that's why that number looks like. Why okay. do you need more money? So, if there was a way to break that down, and, and that might right. be part of the budget 101, saying like, say, hey, well, this is what we spent over here, but this school needs this, and so now, and they're asking for it. I think that would be a, a better way of further breaking it down for um, transparency reasons. And then the other thing um, is we're going as we're headed towards this fiscal cliff as far as um, we need to find some way of you know looking at the outcomes of you know these writing journals or these um, vocabulary uh, the cards and saying like the supplemental stuff that we want to keep buying because oh if there's more stuff here and we want that is it needed is it really getting the outcomes from the students that we need um is it getting successful outcomes because we're gonna have to start making cuts and we're gonna have to start saying no to people because we can't get we you know it's i I've, i'm just kind of concerned about that a little bit um I'm, I'm wondering if we're looking into that and and aware of you know we're gonna have to say no sometimes so I think yes, this, yes, we are very aware of that. Um, and I think when you buy um, sort of a program that has multiple pieces, it's hard to discern exactly what piece is the one thing that might be helping that student to like make that connection. But I think what we hope to see is that if we have school A who may not have purchased, um, you know, the vocabulary cards for fourth and fifth graders, they still could have printed them. So it's sort of like it's hard to like tease out all the variables because the school could have still printed them and laminated and still have them um, versus a school that did and how the achievement of maybe, um, you know, our multilingual learners who have similar start learner profiles, because again, all of our students are so different, like what their learning growth tra trajectory is. I think hold it's often with this type of thing because it's not a singular intervention. I think with something like read 180 or Wilson or in Gillingham where it's a single component and not a multi-layered program that has all these different pieces because there's the reader aloud pieces it's the you know the big books it's the tabletop mini lessons and all these like components it's harder to discern exactly what one piece might have made that really big instructional difference for students um but what 
we can again assure is that we're looking at how are they using it in the classroom. So if you buy vocabulary cards and they're sitting on a shelf, yes, that's a different discussion than if you purchase them and you see students using them and they're, you know, they see the word in their book and then they're looking at the graphic with it and they're really trying to make that connection for one of our students who might be um, a multilingual learner, then that says, okay, that's helping the student access that versus it's still sitting in shrink wrap somewhere, right? That That's saying, okay, that isn't the great fiscal you know, decision. Um, so yes, we, we do try to weigh it with this type of thing. It's a little bit more challenging to know exactly like what is the thing that might make that instructional difference for a student. But it is a great point. And believe me, we are very tightly watching all things and what we're using um, at this point, especially as we're looking at um, preparing that FY25 budget. Any other questions? Thank you for that. OK, there's no further questions, then. Um, may I have a motion to approve the spending, the contract spending authority for a woohoo for HMH? So move Stolowski. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Roll call vote, please, Ms. Cox. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Thank you. OK, so that motion or that contract um, passes through to the contract committee. The next, those were the only two for that are going to the contract committee, correct? I, Dr. DiDonato? Yes. OK, so um, the next one is the GTCAC report, and I will let um, Dr. Um, DiDonato, do you want to um, set this up or do you want to just go right to Dr. Wisted? And Mr. Kearns. I can turn it right over to Dr. Wisted and Mr. Kearns. OK, Dr. Okay. Wisted. I'm looking at the um, agenda, though. It says Crick. Uh, oh, right. whoops, I, I missed. It says Crick. And I was going now. with it's you, a, uh, Chair Lichter. I was like, OK, maybe she's reordering it, and I will just keep letting her go. No, no problem. She, she skipped a row. But while we're here, just um, OK. Well, Mr. Um, Corns is going to Re rewind us. So next on the agenda is the curriculum committee roadmap. And for that, I am going to call on Dr. Donato. I think that's where I got tangled. Sorry, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Kearns. Mr. Corns. Oh, yeah, yeah. OK, so what we wanted to do is based on some of the requests that we've received, um, based on trying to give uh, updates at uh, you know designated intervals about different things that we're implementing, what we wanted to do is outline um, a curriculum committee roadmap. So those things, contracts aside, but topics that we would bring forward um, to share information. So it's learning about what's going on within the system, um, hearing about some different updates of things. Um, and so this is a draft of what we, based on um, feedback that we've received of topics, um, and then really to get your feedback of what may be helpful of, yep, this is in line with what we want, or yeah, that's great, but there's some other things that we'd like to hear also, so that we can also look at the timeliness of when those things happen. So we're giving information along with when those things, uh, we actually get data or reports about it. So this okay. is sort of like an open for discussion type thing, however that works right. here. Right. So um, board members, as you look at, we're in October right now, so as you see what Dr. DiDonato is proposing for November and December, any feedback, questions, additions? I have a couple of questions, Chair Lichter. Go ahead. So I, so I like this and my question, and I'm not sure if this is for um, the, for board members or for, you know, the BCPS staff, um, when are we going to talk about the blueprint and specifically like all that goes? So I know I get it. This is the curriculum committee. But when I think about like the um, college and career readiness, you know, by grade 10, students got to be ready and we that has to be implemented very soon. Um, 
and I know we're not going to talk about that October, November, December, but just to to build in sometimes to start to unpack some of those blueprint items that are tied to curricular pieces. Um, so that that would be one thing. And then in addition to the MCAP data, uh, the MAP data. So um, you all, I know, just administered that or you're in the process of still administering it. So you would have some baseline data. So um, so what was that baseline data? And then what is the target growth rate? For, um, you know, with that map data. Um, so Ms. Booker Dwyer, can I answer your first one for a second yes. before? Doc so um, I know that Dr. Rogers is planning on having reports at the full board meetings on the five pillars. For instance, this coming October 10th is the pre-K, the pre-K pillar. Oh. I know the early childhood one. So I I'm wondering if we would, if, if we should have a standing, a standing agenda item where then after that one, so if we're going to hear about pre-K next week at the full board meeting, some of the questions will be appropriate for the full board. Specific questions that might be more appropriate for our curriculum committee. So then if November we followed up on the pillar that she did in October and then whatever comes for the next board meeting. So I'm wondering if if that makes sense to allow them to go first at the full meeting and then you know, keep track and maybe even send our questions in advance that may be more curriculum based and then have a standing agenda item in reference to the pillars. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Ms. Booker like Dwyer? That. Yep, I like that. Okay. Dr. DiDonato, what do you think? No, I think that sounds great. And um, it, I was about to say that I thought Ms. Booker Dwyer was reading Dr. Rogers' mind um, when she okay. talked about that as we were going to be presenting about Pillar 1 on a uh, Tuesday. So um, yes, we can add that to it. So it'll, I'll title it as like a blueprint follow up so that it can be really a follow up from the board meeting um, with questions. Um, and then map data analysis, um, I can add that for October um, because actually I was, Dr. Elmendorf and I were talking um, and we wanted to move the magnet one back so that it was actually more in alignment with the magnet process and the lottery and some other things that we're looking at with magnet programming. So we can slide out magnet and slide in map. Yeah, Dr. Dudano, do, do we I have another October meeting? Right. I was just gonna say, isn't this? We have the another October. October. This is the October meeting, right? We are in October <laughs> right now. Okay, I got thrown off from last <laughs> month when we had two, so yeah. I'm scheduling that's, myself. That's not um, normal, right? Oh, look, oh, I did all kinds of things here. Okay, all right. Well, I was, I was just going to offer the map, window, now, yeah, the map window closes October 19th. So. Now, if you want to, I mean, it is only the first week in October. It feels like it's past that, but I mean, if the committee wants to add, I don't know when, we'll have to see when our November date is, or, right, so we'd have to redo the roadmap. We've got a, got a little speed bump there now. What is everybody thinking? It is early in October. I wouldn't mind. I think all of this information is important. I wouldn't. I personally wouldn't mind adding another meeting to make sure we can incorporate all of this. I know it, I had several questions, and I think all of those are addressed in this roadmap. So I, um, I would rather not cut anything if that makes sense. Sure, I'm okay. Trying to look a, for. Can I make a comment about the uh, magnet um, presentation? So what we, we were thinking about is um, we met with you in the spring like we're required to do by board policy to talk about magnet programs and you had some amazing questions that not only took us back to think about the answers to the questions but also put some things in action and so we actually ha are going to be convening a work group at the end of this month to address some of the um, questions that you actually had and we are, as I said, required to give you an update on magnet programs every spring by board policy. And so we thought it made a, a heck of a lot more sense to move magnet um, the presentation to the spring so we can do two things. One is give you the required update on magnet programs and what they're gonna look like in the coming year. And also to give you kind of the results of what our work group talked about throughout the year as it relates to admissions and assessment. Are we all good with that? I see some people nodding their heads. Yes, good with that. 
I just want to, I mean, yes. some of our questions, just some of our questions had to do with, you know, assessments and equity. And I just want to make sure that by pushing this to spring, it's not going to push us back as far as implementing, implementing those things or any updates that may need, need to be made for the next magnet um, assessment cycle and uh, application process. That's a great point. Yeah, so that, that wouldn't start until the fall of next year. So we would be able to um, make decisions in time for that. OK, thank you. Our Dr. Next. Allendorf, oops, sorry, Dr. Allendorf, so I don't mess up uh, any more calendaring here, clearly, since I'm not sure where, what month we're in or when we're meeting. Um, what month do you want me to write down to do magnet programs? I believe that um, we talked about doing April, perhaps. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that would work. So our next scheduled meeting is not till November 2nd. So if you want me to look for a time like maybe the week of the 16th, I don't know. I'd have to look at the other committees because everybody's on a lot of committees. Um, we were able to do it last week. I just have to look across all of the committees that we're on and see if there is another time slot. So if you want us to add another October meeting to do the other pieces that you have, Dr. DiDonato, for October minus the magnet, then um, we can we can certainly do that. What's the Shay? I, I just want to note the map window doesn't close until October 19th. So if we wanted okay. a map on there in this the follow up meeting, I could come back and talk more about each of each if we want to. <laughs> I could do that every month so we could swap, but I, I we wouldn't have data before that date. So it would have to be later in the month if you still want map to be on that piece. Just wanted to put that out there. Or we could switch, like you said, the sure. data update with the um, elementary literacy intervention update and then I could still look across. I mean, I, I have no idea what the committees look like. I don't have that paper with me, so I, I it worked. We found some time last week. I have faith that we can find a, a spot, um, but it's up to the committee members. What I heard Ms. Pumphrey is willing to do another one. Um, if we can find a date that works, are the other members willing to do at another October meeting? Yes, that's fine. Um, Ms. Dominowski. Yes, yes, I'm good. Thank you. OK, and OK, all right. So if we add another meeting, then our second October, then then you're right on you're right on months there, Dr. DiDonato. So if we add another October meeting, then what you have for October will work, except we're going to switch the elementary literacy interventions with the um, the MCAP and MAP data update. When so and we're at, and because look, I was a little on target because GTCAC it is October and so we will have Mr. Kearns right now. So then the the topic that would be on that like next October meeting would be um, HMH elementary literacy. You could get a little update on where we are with that. Um, and then elementary literacy interventions. Um, we would put MAP in to November. So MCAP, we ended up doing um, a presentation at the board meeting. So unless there's some other things, questions outstanding about MCAP, I think we we know where we are and we know what we need to do to move forward. Um, we I would probably remove MCAP and just put MAP in for November, um, and then I move Magnet to April, um, and then. I have kindergarten readiness and ESL decentralization of centers still in for December. Right, and then there's the contracts that are timely for each of those meetings. And okay, adding other the, and adding the blueprint follow up would be great. Right. So. Yes. Um, can I just bring up one thing that came through today? I see Megan's going to do the HMH updates in November, and Mr. Kearns, who's on today, um, has novels to be approved. They're out on public display that um, complement that for the advanced academic uh, pathways. So I don't, can we talk about that as part of all that, or do you want that to be a different month other than November? Dr. Dinata, what are you thinking? I'm fine with that. So I have for October well, for the second October meeting, I have <laughs> HMH elementary literacy and elementary literacy interventions and the blueprint follow up because we will have had our October 10th meeting, I'm assuming because it's just a few days. Um, and then we can add to that 
Um, Dr. Wissett, are you saying add to that one or to the November 2nd one, the novels? Um, it doesn't matter. Wade, you're on the call. Do you have a preference? Uh, none, none whatsoever. We'd be ready to go uh, at, at either date. So whatever works best for the committee is perfectly fine with me. Any preferences, committee? No, and I guess along with that, and I, and I guess this is a question for the board members. Is it worthwhile to go over the process to, um, you know, I just keep thinking about all the, the book bans and the, you know, all of this that's happening at our um, board meetings. Is it worthwhile to go over the approval process for to approve a book? Um, I, I don't know what the board members are thinking. Um, you mean as a topic just for them to kind of walk us through what happens when a community member requests a well, book what? to be reviewed? What is the process now that you use to approve a book? Is, is that worthwhile for board members so that at least there's something publicly out there for the public to view and we could point back to say, look at this curriculum committee meeting. Is that worthwhile? Thoughts I from think other that board sounds members worthwhile. Or I, I mean, I get questions about it a lot, so it'll be worthwhile for me. OK. So would you like for us to do in October? We can do what is the process for reviewing curriculum materials? So the curriculum review process for new materials, we could do that in October and then do the actual materials for advanced academics in November. Well, so the way oh, I wait I'm again, kind of, I'm sorry. are we asking for a curriculum? Review materials. Or are we asking for the process when a community member? Oh, if a, someone requests uh, a review yeah. of a book. Okay. Um, Ms. Booker Dwyer, what so, were you referring to? I'm referring specifically to the process that Baltimore County uses to review books, which would fall under your instructional materials. But if we could be very specific for books, so that everyone can see there is a, a clear process and vetting of these materials. And I don't know if that so if November is when we want to talk about the, the the novels and have something maybe then that's wrapped into the November one. Like I don't know, I don't want to try to squeeze too many things in October, November, December. Um, and so just to kind of prioritize, I guess, but just at some point just to have a clear overview of the process that Baltimore County uses. Just to piggyback okay. on that, I don't think it's it's not just like the curriculum materials because we get actually have to approve those contracts for like a widespread use. Mm -hmm. This is more for the schools that are getting their books individually um, or, you know, that's you're not buying a large quantity of for everyone. It's just how are the, the smaller books approved? And even though they're still curriculum and instruction materials, it's not saying that you know, come before the board as approval. So what's the process for those types of books and materials? Is that is that clear as mud? Yep. Yep. I think I have it. OK, thanks. You have our emails if you need clarification as you <laughs> put it together. Okay. OK, any more discussion on the roadmap? And thank so you for I'll make putting this together. Yeah, yeah so I, I'll make some adjustments to it. And then um, when we come back at the second October meeting, um, we can make sure that I we're all flushed out um, pretty clearly. And then for October, we will second October meeting. Um, we'll go over elementary literacy interventions, NHMH blueprint follow up questions from the 1010 board meeting um, and then the book review selection process for books, not necessarily large curriculum orders. OK, OK, I think we got it. And then we will do advanced academic books in November. OK, all right. And the next item on the agenda. Is the report on the GTCAC advanced academics 2022 2023 report. And for that, I call on Dr. Wisted and Mr. Kearns. Sure, um, I'll start. Uh, the GTCAC advocated um, and a, a policy was created that they get a report um, that the board be reported out annually. And so 
Wade then summarizes that information and presents it um, to the GTCAC. And so this was done last month. Um, the board should have received the report at the end of last school year, um, sometime in June uh, or early July. And so Wade can go through uh, a summary of, of the items on the report that is again outlined by the board policy. So Mr. Kearns. Yep, thank you. Um, so as Melissa, uh, Dr. West had just described, uh, this is a, a summary of a report that you all already have. Uh, it was reported or uh, provided to the Board of Education, I believe in June last year. So it exists in board docs. If you're interested in digging into uh, the details of the report, you can certainly look that report up uh, and, and you can uh, go through. Uh, it's a, a 17 or 18 ish page report with lots of charts and graphs and different things. Um, my purpose today is to just provide a summary of that data. I'm not going to be digging through it in great detail, but uh, again, if you're interested in exploring it in further detail yourselves, uh, you can look that report up and you can certainly go through it. Um, next slide, please, Mr. Corns. Um, I just want to mention real quickly, uh, sometimes there's a little confusion about what we mean by advanced academics, so I want to make it clear that when we talk about advanced academics, that's an umbrella term. It encompasses all of the different programs and services that we have for um, our advanced and high potential kids, our advanced and high potential learners. Uh, these things include, these programs and services include gifted and talented GT courses, uh, differentiated instruction at the elementary level, uh, dual enrollment and AP courses at the high school level, uh, and really at any level of potentially subject or grade level acceleration. Uh, what you might think of as skipping a grade, that's sort of the way it's commonly referred to. But uh, so all of those things are included under this umbrella term of advanced academics. Um, next slide. So this report uh, specifically deals with uh, gifted and talented students who are identified as GT. And so we identify students uh, for the first time as GT in English language arts, ELA and or math at the end of grade three. Of course, I was just here last time talking about how we're going to move that because of the revised math course sequence to grade two. So this year we'll be doing this actually for grades two and three. Uh, but the data that's reflected in the report that we're referring to today uh, deals with kids who were identified at the end of grade three, so GT students starting in grade four. Students then are additionally identified as GT in science and or social studies at the end of grade five as they transition from elementary to middle school and GT courses in those two subjects become available. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this just gives you an idea, and this, by the way, is the data um, the, from school year 22-23, uh, so last school year. Uh, this is a comparison of the percentage of student groups uh, represented in the GT population compared to the percentage of that student group in the total BCPS population. So this slide sort of shows that we still have some inequities in identification within GT programs and services. So particularly our black and brown students are underrepresented in the GT population, and our white students in particular are overrepresented in the GT population. Uh, and so this slide shows uh, those student groups by race. Uh, the next slide, if you go to the next slide, Mr. Corns shows by special service group, uh, our English learners, our special education students, and our farms students. And again, you can see that in each of these cases, again, we still struggle with inequities and in identification uh, of students for participation in these various programs and services. Uh, and so that's a big part of our work. We've talked about that um, a little bit again when we were talking about uh, identification and universal screening last week. Uh, this continues to be a big part of the work for us in our office and across the system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the data report that we're referring to, if, if it's a data memo uh, that the superintendent presents to the board on an annual basis. As Dr. Wisted mentioned, uh, this is in response to policy 6401. A portion of policy 6401 details five different areas that need to be reported on on an annual basis in relationship to students specifically identified 
um, as gifted and talented. And so those five uh, areas are student achievement, attendance, the suspension rate, graduation rate, and standardized test scores. However, if you take the time to go through the memo itself, you'll notice that there are only four sections in the memo, uh, setting aside the introduction. Um, and those four sections are achievement, attendance, suspension rate, and graduation rate. Uh, the reason for that is because we report on those standardized test scores in the achievement section of the data memo. So the standardized test scores are there. We just uh, include that in the achievement section of the data memo. So if you take the time to go to the memo, I just want you to be aware uh, of the fact that you might think, wait a minute, I thought there's supposed to be five sections, there's only four. It's because we fold the, te uh, the test scores into the achievement section. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk for a moment about the achievement section, uh, which includes standardized assessment scores. Um, in each one of these different categories, uh, there was a decline in the three year period that was looked at for this particular data memo. And I should mention what those years are. These, um, the data that uh, we base this on is provided to us uh, at the end of September or beginning of October. And so the data, the three year period that we're looking at is the previous three school years. So for the data memo uh, that you all received in June of last year, it included school years 1920, uh, 2021, and 2122. Uh, so those that's the three year period that is being referred to uh, in all of the data that's being discussed, kind of summarized today, uh, and that's in the actual data memo itself if you uh, choose to, to peruse it. Uh, so for that three year period, we did see a decline in both reading and map scores um, in uh, uh, middle school. Um, we do not, by the way, because of the three year period covered um, and because of when we started identifying students as, as GT uh, in our student information system, uh, the fourth and fifth grade students are not included in the data in last year's data memo. So I just want to mention that this just includes students six to 12 uh, in that particular time frame. Um, so anyway, the MAP scores, we did see a decline in MAP scores. There's some inconsistency in the uh, various uh, student groups. Again, if you want to kind of dig through all of the data in detail, you'll see that uh, some student groups, uh, the scores remain pretty static. There might have been a very slight decline or increase, uh, but less than a percentage point. Um, some student groups did better. Uh, most student groups, the scores declined. And so overall, uh, we saw a definite decline in scores in uh, MAP scores, um, in SAT, in both the EBRW and the math, uh, the mean scores. Again, there were some inconsistencies in student groups, but there was a decline. Um, and then the uh, percentage of students who were earned an A or a B as a, a final grade, uh, there are, you'll notice for uh, mathematics, there are uh, four courses that were um, kind of uh, amalgamated, I guess, uh, advanced five math, GT Algebra 1, GT Algebra 2, and AP Calc AB. Uh, so the average across all of those courses of students who got an A or a B was, uh, you can see, almost 78%, not quite 78%, uh, in uh, GT ELA 7, 10, AP 11, and AP 12, uh, it was 79% of GT students earned an A or B in those courses. Uh, and so those are were sort of the achievement measures that we have detailed in that data memo. Um, and again, uh, paints a picture of a decline in uh, student achievement among our GT students during that three year period. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of attendance, uh, the attendance uh, rate did decline over that three year period. Uh, I will point out that there were impacts to student attendance. Um, uh, due to virtual learning uh, in general, uh, the attendance rate actually increased um, during that time. And so when you look at it over a three year period, there was sort of a, I don't want to call it an artificial high, but but certainly the attendance uh, was a little bit higher uh, during um, the virtual period of virtual learning that certainly had an impact on attendance rates. Uh, but nonetheless, when you look at that three year period, there was a decline uh, across that three year uh, period in both middle school and high school. Uh, and again, that decline um, 
was inconsistent over various student groups. When you break down the data by student group, uh, again, there are some student groups where the attendance remained pretty much the same, uh, just a couple where the attendance went up. The majority of them, the attendance did decline slightly during that time period. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we did look at suspension rates. That's one of the other categories that uh, were uh, is mandated by the policy. Uh, the suspension rates did increase from 2019 to 2022. Um, it, there was a particular increase in suspension rates. Um, when you uh, look at the suspension rates for um, the school year uh, 2020 to 2021, when uh, students returned to in-person learning, um, there was a, a significant increase uh, uh, particularly in middle school, uh, the suspension rate in middle school um, uh, went from two and a half, about two and a half percent of GT students um, in that uh, 19 to 20 year were suspended. It jumped to just a little bit over six and a half percent in that 21-22 school year. Um, there was also an increase at the high school level, though it was much less significant. Um, the increase at the high school level uh, wasn't as sharp as it was at the middle school level. Um, again, that first year back from virtual learning was, we know, a tough year for students um, in a lot of ways. And so uh, we think that that's part of the reason why we see that reflected in those that increase in the suspension rate uh, in that particular year um, over the course <coughs> of that three year period. Bless you. Uh, next Thank slide, you. please. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, the graduation rate did decline very slightly. It uh, wasn't very much, but it did go down just a little bit from 99.2 to 98.8 or 85. Um, and so there was a slight decline in that three-year period in our graduation rate for GT students, although obviously it remains very high uh, at almost 99%. Um, again, there was some inconsistency across student groups. That's a, a persistent theme throughout all of this data. Uh, if you have the opportunity to look through the memo, you'll see again that some student groups stayed the same, some went up slightly, some went down a little bit more, um, but uh, but overall there was a decline. When you look at all of our GT students together, uh, there was a slight decline in the graduation rate over that three-year period. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then finally, I just want to mention that um, uh, obviously we have these are uh, the four priority areas for our superintendent and for our system. Uh, one of those is academic achievement is reflected in this data that's reported in this memo. Um, we are going to continue to work to put in place high quality curricular interventions, professional learning, professional learning communities to try to meet the needs of our advanced and high potential learners and our GT kids. Um, so we're going to continue that work. That's work that we've been doing for quite some time and it's certainly work that we will continue. Uh, and then uh, next slide is just for any questions. That's the presentation. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them uh, at this time. So thank you for sharing um, that information with us. Are there questions from board members? Okay. I have quite no. Nope, I have question. I always wait. I never want to be the first one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ms. Booker Dwyer, do you have a question? Yes. Yeah, so thank you for this presentation. Um, can we go back to the slide system data by race. Mm, that was a uh, slide four, I think. Yes, slide course. four. And on that slide, so do we know the root causes for for the over enrollment or under enrollment of certain populations? And the sh and what strategies are we going to use to address it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that the uh, causes are multivariate, so it's it's there is no single cause, right? So we can't point to one thing and say this is the single reason why this happens. Um, certainly, there are systemic um, inequities that we face. There are barriers, all sorts of barriers that we are working to dismantle. So there are certainly things like that that uh, that are um, contributory factors to all of that. Um, and uh, I don't know, Mr. Corns, if you could get back to that slide. Uh, well, anyway, um, I keep wanting to click on it on my PowerPoint, but I know that it's not going to do any good. <laughs> so, um, but uh, but there are um, obviously uh, multiple issues that um, or, or multiple factors that contribute to the inequities that exist in terms of GTI identification. Um, 
one of the, there are a number of different things that we're doing to address that. Uh, one of them is to try to make sure that the practices that we have in place for identifying students are the most equitable practices that are available. And so that's one of the reasons why, for example, we use universal screening in order to identify kids. Many school systems use a referral system where a teacher will refer particular students who then go through a screening process. So you have sort of a, a two step process uh, where only certain students are screened for identification. So universal screening, look at looking at all of the kids in a particular grade level instead of using a referral system is an equitable best practice. One of the other things that we're exploring is is the um, application of school based norms rather than looking at national norms or even um, system wide norms. So for example, what I mean by that is that um, uh, instead of uh, comparing students at uh, school A to students in Baltimore County as a whole, you're just comparing students at school A to the other students in school A. And so you're in a sense, your advanced students in school A are whatever students are performing at the highest levels at that particular school. Uh, and that's a, a practice that we're exploring in terms of sort of like how to incorporate that into our um, universal screening processes. So there's a variety of things that we're doing. The part of the reason that we're bringing forward the books that we're bringing forward in um, what did we decide November? Is that right? I think we decided November is when we're bringing forth the books. But part of the reason that we're doing that is because we we recognize that we need to replace some of the books that have been um, in place for our advanced and our GT readers for a pretty long time at the elementary level uh, with books that are more uh, recently published, that are more relevant, culturally relevant, um, that um, uh, reflect the diversity of the of the kids that we have in our buildings. And so that's that's a piece of it too, is updating the curriculum and making sure that that curriculum is is uh, culturally relevant and speaks to the kids that are are in our buildings. So there's a variety of different things that we're doing. We continue working um, in terms of professional learning as well. Um, all of those things are things certainly that we continue to work on in order to try to address some of those inequities that exist. Um, so I will the universal screening. So the universal yes, process was used for this group of data that you shared with us. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So it may not, so the universal screening process may not be equitable. And I know nationally, mm -hmm. what, so this data reflects like national data. This is happening all mm -hmm. over. And I know that when they dig deeper, what they what was found was that there was a trend where if you had a black principal, then you saw more black students enrolled in advanced academic courses. If you have a Hispanic principal, you saw mm -hmm. more Hispanic students enrolled in. So there was, they found this correlation in some cases with who's the school leadership and the students that are getting enrolled. Has, has that type of analysis been done? Um, or even down to like the teachers who are teaching these advanced academic courses. Um, sometimes students, and, and sometimes mm -hmm. it's just, it could be an implicit bias sometimes when placing sure. these students or with, with that universal screen. So just to make sure that none of, None of that is happening in Baltimore mm -hmm. County would be helpful because it doesn't appear that the universal process, the universal screening process that's being implemented now is yielding those equitable results. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, I mean, I know I know that some states are even moving toward um, school systems just having a, a opt in process where it's not this universal screening. It's not this where you, and I have, you know, there's pros and cons to that. But what you're seeing with these opt in models are you are seeing a more diverse student body in those classes mm -hmm. and so it may be uh, necessary for baltimore county just to look beyond universal screening um, and i agree with you the ref the references mm -hmm. that definitely was a huge cause of inequities but looking at maybe some other models to expand options for kids because some kids may not even conceive themselves in those GT classes or in dual enrollment or, and we know we have to get those numbers up for blueprint anyway, when we talk about dual enrollment. So um, just looking at some of those innovative sure. Yeah, and I will say this, it, it's, um, 
we currently identify about 42% of our students in Baltimore County Public Schools as gifted and talented across uh, all grades, uh, which is an extraordinarily high percentage of students. Um, the state average is 16%. And so we, the, the only system in um, Maryland that identifies a higher percentage of their students as GT than Baltimore County is Howard County. Um, and we currently identify almost, not quite, but almost it's 32 point something percent of our uh, black students as GT. So almost uh, one out of every three of our black students are identified as as GT, which is also an extraordinarily high percentage if you look at national percentages and so on. Uh, part of the reason that we've have sort of like um, Part of the reason that we've continued to have uh, these inequities in identification isn't so much that we're not identifying enough black students or Hispanic students. It's because we're identifying in a sense too many uh, white students. So in other words, what happened was um, we if you if you picture the pie and each slice is a ratio, we instead of adjusting the ratios, we just made the circumference of the pie bigger. And so we're identifying more and more students as GT, but um, so that that whole pie is getting bigger, but the ratio of the slices hasn't changed as much as we would like them to. Has changed in a positive direction. It's not that there hasn't been any positive change uh, over time. There has been, um, but uh, but one of the ways to uh, I guess that you could kind of look at it. There's a couple of different ways that 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 inec those inequities can be balanced out. Uh, one way is to increase the percentage uh, or the 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 number of black students who are being identified. Another way is to decrease the number of white students who are being identified. And so that's that's part of where we need part of what we're looking at, um, and that's part of what we believe may. Uh, how we may be able to help address that issue through the use of school based norms rather than using um, system based norms. So that's part of the reason why school based norms are an attractive option when it comes to addressing the, the inequities that we have currently. I hope that makes sense. I don't know. Sometimes I'm not sure if I'm trying to explain things with my hands, so I don't know if that make makes sense or not, but. It, it makes sense, but I also don't want to. Um... You know, you never want to take opportunities away from another mm -hmm. group of students, and especially if they're because there's there's benefits to being in these advanced academic pathways. So, um, so that's just also some that's a fine line to to cross. Um, mm -hmm. You know, to to equalize something, you don't want to remove something from someone else. That that could be difficult as well. So, you all have a hard job to do, um, but I'm sure you'll figure it out. We're working on it. Yeah. Um. To Miss Booker Dwyer's point, if I mean 42%, they're not all truly gifted and talented. Mm -hmm. But the data you showed us was pretty good for kids who are identified as gifted and talented. So, so if students are rising to the occasion, it, it just goes to the opt-in idea. Like if students are rising to the occasion and doing well, I'll call. 100%, I mean, 100% of them gifted and talented. So mm -hmm. I, I realize it's not a true percentage of true giftedness. Sure. Um, but if they're doing well in those advanced courses. Right. Then it, that's the outcomes are what we what we would want. So it's sure. like, right, it's a hard line to to cross. I mean, right. I don't want us to reduce it, but. I, I'm not sure. I, I I know I'm making sense. I'm just not sure what the next the next step right. is. Okay. Any other um, questions from board members about the presentation that we just saw? Okay. That was the last agenda item. Now, um, I know that Miss Pump. And so now we would be going to any further business part. Or the, is there any further business? Miss Pumphrey does have a curriculum type question, but I don't know if it's a short response or if it's a agenda item for the roadmap. So can I let her ask the question and then you can let us know if it's a short response or a a presentation response? So Ms. Pumphrey, are you still there? I should have done that yes. first. Yes, I'm here. And I did sort of get a general answer from oh, myself. Okay. And I, I wouldn't mind having more specific to make sure that I'm correct. <laughs> and it's okay. just regarding the um, 
scheduling for high schools as far as whether they're a block schedule and whether they're a hybrid schedule and some schools seem to be different and as uh, and time wise as far as the length of class times whether it's 80 minutes 90 minutes when they're pulling out some minutes to have that um, special time between classes for coach class or, or things like that is there a specific time as far as length length of time that each uh, high school class period is required to be or is there variation amongst each high school variation i can be real fast <laughs> but but is there an average number of minutes a course has to take like does a course have to be a certain length i know we that high schools have to go a certain amount of hours to school but are is there a certain set for courses go ahead miss shay so yes and no it's more in line the only state level requirement is exactly what you described about the number of hours that's that um you know schools have high school students have to be in school to receive credit. Um, the, the variations have to be within a window. So in terms of the hours over a semester. So in other words, if you're a semesterized class and you meet every day, um, that's one schedule. We do still have one high school that that uses. Uh, well, actually, we have three high schools that have a semesterized um, approach. Then you have some variation where um, in terms of bell times ranging from 82 to 90, depending on if they've uh, shortened the periods to create that extra coach class time that Ms. Pumphrey uh, referenced. Um, but there is not like high school classes must be a minimum mm -hmm. of X number of minutes per day. Um, certainly within reason, we have to certify each year that as a system we are offering comprehensive aligned to all of the um, standards. So we wouldn't be able to have a course that was offered like once a week for a month. Um, so, so there are reasonable parameters, but there's not like a specific um, every class must be a minimum of there's there's a range based on other schedules considerations. OK, thank you. Sure. OK, thank you for that. So is there any other further business from anybody? Board members or staff? OK, um, again, thank you to all the staff who presented today, who answered all of our questions. Um, these meetings are really informative and we truly appreciate them. I have will work on finding that other date and seeing if it magically works for everybody. Um, so I'll get back to everybody um, very soon. Since there's no further business, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.